Greetings and welcome everybody to our live demo on the HP Latex Printer Series. My name is Joe Jones and I'm the owner of Big Systems. Joining me from Big Systems are John Peterman, Jason Eipert, and Matt Geller. And joining me from HP are Steve Kotars and our primary presenter, Timothy Mitchell. And we are live from his garage outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we will be taking questions throughout the webinar. If you would just kindly put them into the chat box, which is at the bottom of your screen uh, when time allows, uh, we, will, uh, we will note the questions and put them out to our HP experts uh, to provide answers. Um, we anticipate that the demonstration will last about 60 minutes and then we will leave plenty of time uh, at the end for questions, answers, and follow up. We've got a diverse group of clients on the webinar uh, today. And those of you may be in the group, may already be an H HP Latex printer uh, customer. You may be looking at a standalone Latex printer. You may be interested in a bundled print and cut system, or you might be interested in a higher volume bulk ink system. In all of these units are currently offering instant rebates, trade-ins, and trade-off offers. Uh, HP has the best pricing on this equipment that they ever have in their history and uh, certainly uh, we'll be happy to follow up with you on any pricing and promotion information that you might be interested in after the webinar. Uh, also in addition to really good promotional pricing, HP has implemented some very aggressive financing programs which include low or no payments for the first eight months of the lease program which would stretch you into not having a first payment until 2021. Now I'd like to introduce to you Timothy Mitchell. Tim is HP's self-appointed latex czar. He's been in digital printing since 1992 and working with, latex, with the latex product line for over eight years. I think you'll find him to be engaging, informative, and entertaining. And if you still don't have enough of Tim after this presentation, you can find out more about Timothy and the HP Latex line on his LinkedIn page and on YouTube. And with that, Timothy, I'll turn it over to you. I actually have a little cough because we have a ton of pollen. I have the garage door open. I'm Timothy Mitchell. I'm reaching you from Cumming, Georgia. It is just north of Atlanta, well, about 30 miles. And uh, we're right here on Lake Lanier. I have the garage door open. Hopefully the well, carpenter bees and the neighborhood animals won't invade the garage that happens. We do have a special visitor coming in about a half an hour. So I will introduce you to our special guest. Uh, I have turned my, well, it's sort of a garage. It's sort of a workshop. It's sort of a house. Uh, it was a boxing gym and then, you know, Things happened because of the need to work out of the garage. I got tired of taking the bag down, so I just figured I'd put a sticker on it and somehow incorporate into the presentation. I know it doesn't really make sense. Um, Joe, would you be so kind as to make sure everyone is muted? Yes. Thanks, bud. Sorry about Good. that. I, I've hit the mute button. No, those, things, those things happen. It's perfectly fine. I have to imagine you are all like this close to super saturation with webinars. So I'm, I, uh, I reached out to Alice Cooper and Gene uh, Simmons, asked them for some help. They said lasers, smoke pots. I don't have either. I don't have any lasers. I don't have any smoke pots. So I'm coming. Hold on a minute. I got to find who that is. Just a second. There we go. Thanks, Tim. No trouble. So I'll do thy best to be entertaining by explaining the technology. Uh, this is latex. Latex does not really exist in the sense that you understand it. It's a brand. We had to get a name for synthetic resin copolymer. So we couldn't say the new HP synthetic resin copolymer printers because that doesn't trip off the tongue. So we came up with latex. Latex is sort of a nice way to describe this. It's not quite the latex you think of with paint or gloves. It doesn't have anything to do with that. But what it does and what we wanted to communicate is 
It is a water-based ink technology that is pigmented inks, and we have an encapsulation component, the resin synthetic copolymer, that when it's heat activated, completely encapsulates the prints and gives them outdoor durability, handleability, scratch resistance, and a whole host of other features that we feel allows us to compete at the highest levels with this class of printer. This class of printer generally competes against solvent printers. Okay? We offered an alternative to solvent printers because we are an ink chemistry company. That's effectively what we do. HP invents new ink. We invent new ink in conjunction with our print head teams because we own our own print head manufacturer. We develop all our own print heads. And then the two together then work with our color engineers, our color mathematicians, our software writing systems teams, our electronic teams, and we put the whole thing together. And then we manufacture everything end to end. So HP Inc., HP Print Heads, HP Electronics, HP Waveforms, HP Software, and HP Printer. It's all one vertical. It's not like we're taking bits and pieces and parts from other companies, putting them together in some kind of a well-intentioned Frankenstein monster, and hopefully it all works together. If it doesn't, they all point fingers. We don't have any of that because everything in here is our technology. As I mentioned, we're really an ink chemistry company. That's true. As long as you can invent your own ink, latex, and as long as you can invent your own printheads, you can make the two work together and then come up with something very innovative in the market. Up until latex, you had very limited options to go outdoor. Option one, solvent. Back in those days, it was more of an acetone solvent. I know because I breathed a ton of it. Uh, it was like huffing glue. I was high as a kite by nine o'clock in the morning. I reeked, I, I sweated the stuff, and I honestly hated working with it. Now, they tried to temper that by making it more of an, uh, an alcohol-based solvent, but it still remains a solvent ink chemistry. You have to evaporate the solvent, and that's what leaves your, what's left in your ink on the page. You have a certain drying time in most cases, and it's all solvent-based. There's also UV. Now, UV is a little different. Uh, UV is a slightly different structure and is a diff certainly different than solvent. We don't really compete with UVs because these printers at this price point are much, much lower. We tend to compete with UVs more with our latex flatbeds, and we have two of those. These are directed more for roll-to-roll. -roll. I certainly can compete against UV. I have a better color gamut. I have the same exceptional scratch resistance, and I do compete with them in a lot of respects. Latex is much more flexible. It's a more elastic ink chemistry. Mostly UV is used for boards. You put it on flat boards. With latex, you can print flat boards with the flatbeds, but I do roll to roll. So anything here, it's on a roll, usually a three inch core, I can print just about anything. The print heads. Our print heads are very different from solvent print heads. Solvent printers all use piezo print heads. Two of the bigger uh, uh Panasonic makes them, Toshiba makes them, Epson makes them. We use thermal. Canon also uses thermal. Canon and HP invented the thermal print head decades ago together, two separate teams working in two parts of the world. And they were both given patents for thermal print head technology. Thermal print head technology we've had under patent for decades. And it just actually, the original, which has been renewed, <clears throat> finally ended after, you know, 30 years. Now, we've created many, many, many more variants, and we still have solid patents on all of our technology. We use these thermal print heads from the tiniest little cash register to giant industrial web presses, the page wides. We know the technology. We know how it works. It's very elegant. What we're doing is we are heating water to a certain point. That pressure forces the drop to be released. Canon famously called it the bubble jet, which is kind of true. It is a bubble jet. And it forces the pressure to release a, uh, a, um, a bubble or a, an ink droplet through the nozzle, and then that goes where we direct it to. So it's a very easy, Ill elegant situation. It uses pressure more than, say, piezo, which uses mechanics. And as a result, we can put far more nozzles into a given area, into a concentrated area, than a piezo can. So this particular print head, latex print head, they cost about $125 each. 
They're user replaceable. So if you have to replace it, you just take one out and put one in just like you do with your little desktop printer. And the print heads have 2,112 nozzles. Rush 2112, we are the priests of the temples of Syrinx. Hat tip to Neil Peart, uh, he is missed. 2,112 nozzles, you'll never forget it. They're also a 12 picoliter drop, so very small drop, lots of nozzles, 1,200 DPI. We can make these all different sizes and structures because we control all of these templates. It's extremely easy for us to structure a print head to do a specific thing. This printer is a sign and display printer fundamentally, and we call it a wide format sign and display. Most of the things you're gonna print are 18 by 24 and larger and much larger. So that's the scope of the printer. Print heads are durable, water-based. Don't kid yourself and don't let anybody say, they don't really go outdoor, or water can't go outside. We have a seven year warranty with 3M for their vehicle wrap system. It's 3M certification and MCS certification. That 3M certification, I think more than anything else, when you really compare apples to apples, my question would be how come, if solvent's so great outside, how come Latex has a seven year warranty with 3M and you guys only have five year warranties? That's because we last two more years outside in direct sunlight measured by 3M's own advanced weathering systems before our ink starts fading, okay? I mean, that's really, uh, there's no better example for our outdoor color fast durability than a seven year warranty with 3M. We have 10 to 13 years for a lot of highway signage. I think that's a real testament to how good we are really outside. But this print head is the key. Let me give you an example, one of the big advantages, which just came up recently. I posted a LinkedIn article called, Why a Latex Printer is Like a Cactus. And the reason it's like a cactus is, if I were to go away for three months right now, that printer sitting there, I'm just gonna shut the garage door and go away. And in three months, I'll come back, I'll load that very media there, I'm gonna press print, it's going to print a chart. Maybe it throws me a message because it checks the nozzles and says, you know, you have some nozzles missing, but probably within 15 minutes, I can be up and running on this printer, having done nothing whatsoever. Even if the power went out, it's not really going to make any difference because everything will be left in a capped state. There's no waste ink container. It doesn't have to do constant printing and purging. It doesn't have to do much of anything because it's a cactus. It sits on the shelf, try not to overwater it. Solvent printer is like owning a dog. You clean it, you maintain it, you feed it, you travel with it. You have to constantly be on the printer because the minute you turn your back, it's gonna clog and then you're gonna lose your print heads and then you're gonna lose, you lose your ink lines. So this three months, we've been off for two. I have seven latex printers in the demo center. I got every last one of them running on Monday in less than an hour. Baseline, perfect prints. I guarantee you nobody with seven solvent printers just went through that. They're probably still ordering print heads because solvent clogs. The default condition is to clog. You have to keep it running constantly and printing constantly and purging constantly and wasting ink constantly. What happens if you have a power outage? Virgin Islands had the hurricane. They were down for six months. Every solvent printer on the island is toast unless you did a lot of cleaning of everything and took it all apart ahead of time. The latex, they just put them on blocks, let the water go through, dropped them back out, plugged them in, they're good to go. The way that it monitors if I had a nozzle out is called the optical drop detector. The optical drop detector is a customized HP patented tool that checks the print heads continuously. When it comes out of hibernation, checks the print heads. It's an energy star printer, so it goes into hibernation when you don't run it for an hour. This thing is golden. It makes sure that I never have a nozzle missing. If a nozzle is missing, it maps the location automatically with one of the extra 2,112 nozzles. It knows that I have a nozzle out. It's not responding. It, go puts another, it goes and puts another nozzle there. That is a very unique thing for latex that we're able to do 
that nobody has anything like this. There are some printers that have a manual mapping system, but you're almost better off just printing and purging and running slower rather than figuring out where your nozzles are out. You don't have to do anything with this other than to just leave it there. That is called the optical drop detector. We also have a nifty tool on the printer, also highly patented. The uh, HP engineer that invented this out of California actually sent me a nice letter because I made a video about his OMOS. This is the advanced media sensor. What this does is there's a light here, and when I load media, which I'm about to do, I left it unloaded so I can show you the walkthrough. It's going to register the back of the media. It's going to feed the media forward and backward, and it's going to determine what is the perfect step alignment without you having to do anything, and it does it digitally. It also works for double-sided printing. So the latex printer, let me see if I can find one here, is capable of doing double-sided printing. Side A, side B. Okay, it duplexes. There's a process. I have a bunch of videos on it that are on YouTube. And this is what it uses to identify the registration marks that I print on side A. The 365 and the 500 series support double-sided printing. And that's what this is used for as double duty. We also have another nice tool on here, which I'm about to use, called a spectrophotometer. HP, our engineers, built our own color software using our own algorithms and all of our own chemistry and then paired it with an I1 that is built right on the printer. So when I load this media, which is a Avery 3303, okay, it's an El Cheapo Avery monomeric vinyl, widely used for print and cut. I have downloaded it from the media locator. Right on the printer, we have a link to really thousands of different medias that you can put right into the printer. When I download it, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a closed loop color calibration. What that does, I have one over here somewhere. I was just playing around with it. I'll get it a little bit later. I'll cut Ganesh first. What that does is it establishes your CMYK, light cyan, light magenta, and then puts a fingerprint of those density signatures in time. In three months, if I change one of these print heads, the printer is going to say, you've changed something fundamental. We're going to ask that you recalibrate. And the more frequently you recalibrate, and it only takes about 10 minutes, and it's all automated, so you don't have to do anything except mash the button. That's what we say here in the South, mash the button. So if you mash the button and it prints the chart, it reads the chart, and then it gauges your color densities and establishes the correct color density so that it adjusts your prints. That way you're always printing the same colors, both within a printer to itself over time and if you share that file with other printers. That is all based on having a spectrophotometer on board. The spectrophotometer also, in the case of this 365 and the 500, is used as a tool to read and create ICC profiles. When people say profile, technically speaking, an ICC profile is a very specific thing. This is a chart, not this one. This is a chart of an ICC profile done on 3M IJ40 in which I press a button, it prints all the swatches, the spectrophotometer reads the swatches and then compares those swatches to objective lab values for each of those colors and then corrects to try to get you as close as possible so that when you print that color, we're trying to get you as close to that color as possible or at least to understand how far away that color is from a given mean target. It's a fairly sophisticated process. It's widely standard in the industry but our printers have onboard spectros. Now you can use an external one. I have a bunch of them, you can't quite see them here. I1, Barbieri, uh, x right Isis. Those are entirely valid to use in the RIP. And if you wanna build all your own stuff, have at it, totally fine. But we do have it built into the printer. It is the only printer in its price point anywhere near it that has that stuff built in. Cause you can't just stick a spectrophotometer on a printer. You have to build the color software to read it and then to make something of it. And that's something that we've done and we're years out in front of everybody else. And I think that's a hallmark of latex. 
We also have a few other things that are worth noting. Gen 3 latex, which is what this is, Gen 3, we're on our third generation. Gen 3 latex uses convection heat to come to temperature quickly. And in the past, there used to be two, not one, but two heaters. There was a heater here, and then there was the heaters here. That's where these are now. The heaters that were up there were designed to be able to take enough of the water out of the solution before you move to the curing part. So there were two heaters. There was an evaporative heater that would take the water out or most of it out so the ink would not bleed. And then the second one would finish the job and then it would activate the latex component. Well, the trouble is you have two issues with putting water or heat in the print zone. It causes vertical banding, it causes various image quality problems, and you're really limited by speed. Your speed is determined by how much water can I take out before this ink runs for the exits and creates bleeding or you know, what we in the industry call coalescence, which really is bleeding within the color, kind of a fish-eyed effect. Or if you were printing on canvas, for example, what would happen is you'd put this ink down on a canvas, all this ink because you want a heavy saturation, and then the ink would just bleed down into the valleys and leave white flecks on the top because you can't stop the ink from moving. There's more ink than heat. The only solution was to use less ink or slow it down both things that I don't want to do. And then we had that heater there. People would lift it up and look on. I had one guy send me a photo. He actually looked into it and then burned like a, a wedge right on his forehead. Took a picture of his forehead. I knew exactly what it was. And it slowed the printer down and it made it a little cumbersome. What we did is replace the whole process with optimizer. And I'll explain that in a second because that's a really cool advance that's unique to our technology. Optimizer and all the inks come in 775 milliliters. A 775 milliliter box runs all of our 300 series. The 500 series, you have the 560 uses these, the 570 uses this in conjunction with a three liter box. So you have one of these and a three liter running. I'm gonna grab that phone, hang on. Hey Joe, can you try to track down who's not muted? I am look I'm looking as we speak. All right, I'll let you handle that and I'll resume. So 775 milliliters, in a lot of cases, our ink size is double what a lot of our OEM competitors are for the same price. So these are very affordable. It is HP chemistry. Because the chemistry involved in our inks is very complicated, it's not like solvent. This is an extremely difficult ink chemistry to manufacture, first invent and then manufacture. That's why so other few companies do it. There's really nobody out there making a, a latex ink. And even our knockoffs, people trying to knock it off, they're usually a generation or two late. They're not doing Gen 3 inks. And even if they did, honestly, I don't think they could manufacture them in any tolerance. It's a very sophisticated ink chemistry because, again, we are an ink chemistry company. We are always inventing new inks. It is very difficult to keep up with us. They can keep up with solvent. I mean, a college chemistry student can make solvent inks. Those are extremely easy to make. It's very difficult to make resin copolymer pigment-based, water-based pigment inks. And that, I think, gives us a huge advantage. Another consumable on the printer is the ink, um, the ink cartridge. All this is really is a capping station, a wiping station, and then over time you just slide this whole thing out and replace it. Okay, it's not very expensive, it lasts a long time, 14 liters, so I usually replace one of these like uh, twice a year. And then there'll be a little bit of ink in the bottom when you take this out because it wipes everything. Just put a cap on it, wrap it up, standard recycling, okay? Standard recycling. The print heads and the ink cartridges, we will pay you to give us back. If you want to send one to Sam Ink, he's still working on trying to knock off our inks. I send him one once in a while. How's it going, Sam? Here's a cartridge, you know, helping you out. They're not going to make them. They couldn't make them if they wanted to. 
And the reason why, let me explain it, that optimizer ink there is one of these and has its own print head. And what optimizer does is it, think of it like ink sticky. We wanted to create something where we could take the heat out of the print zone and then we wanted to create something so that when we dropped ink in the print zone, it would stay put. And we got this from one of our other technologies because we do, you know, HP is a, a huge company in terms of printing. So one of our other digital groups had experimented with taking ink, pairing it with a solution. It's not a primer. All amounts land on the material. And then right behind it, we would put the ink. What we've done is we've had the solution and the ink charged chemically, much like you would have magnetics. So have you ever seen rare earth magnets, those really strong ones? It's very analogous to standing on a seven story building. You're standing there with a tomato and inside the tomato is a rare earth magnet. Down at the bottom of the seven story building is a cup and you're gonna put the tomato in the cup. And then here's the other part you're standing on a building that's actually moving. So the building is going backward as the cup is coming up and the cup is coming up and we figured everything out. But what we didn't figure out is how do we attract the tomato into the cup? Well, that's where the chemistry comes in. The ink is charged anionically. The, the uh, um, optimizer is charged cationically. And when you release the tomato, it goes down and then the magnets pull it into the cup and it controls where we land the drop it also prevents the drop once it does land, we call it pinning, we prevent it from moving. It doesn't walk away. Normally what happens if you were to say run out of ink, the middle of a print, I have a half an hour before it stops beeping and it will drop the job. So I can go get another ink, put it in. I have a phone that monitors everything on the printer. So if it runs out of ink, it'll automatically go uh, tell me. I get a notification. I go and I, let's say 15 minutes later, I walk over there, change out the ink, put it in. It will resume printing. I will not even notice where it stopped. And the reason I won't is because that thing can sit, all this wet ink held together by the chemical attraction between the optimizer and the ink. This is extremely important in giving us more speed, reducing vertical banding to non-existent, getting rid of all kinds of image defects associated with having temperature in the curing zone or in the print zone. And then lastly, I can turn optimizer up a little or down a little depending on the texture of the, mater the material. Excuse me. So this floor graphic, for example, this is Jessup Catwalk. And I printed this about a couple weeks ago. The Jessup Catwalk is a very thick textured floor graphic. It's designed for short-term trade shows. I'm going to keep it out here for a pretty long time. It'll be fine. It's not laminated. I print on it and I turn the sticky up a little because it's so textured. When the ink lands on that textured surface, it wants to kind of go into the rivulets and I want to hold it in place. Same with canvas. Same with some textured wall coverings. I use a little more for fabric. But then when I'm back to smooth adhesive vinyl, I can bring it down to say 12%, which is what the default settings are. So it's an extremely adjustable, kind of flexible thing, and it's sticky. It gives us an enormous valuable, and we're able to double all of our speeds because of it. And that's the key thing to getting more speed is I don't need any, I don't have any blockage or any interruption in my pipeline because of having to evaporate at that stage. And that's what Optimizer does, again, in HP Innovation. Probably the last thing I want to show you here, just to, like some of the little show and tell stuff. We have edge guards. These are your standard edge guards. I also make a nice pair of butterfly edge guards, which I just take these apart and make it longer. It helps a lot with, say, high intensity or diamond grade um, reflective highway signage, some card stocks, you know, heavier stuff that I need a little bit longer edge guard to hold it down. I'm going to go and load this now. All of our printers, by the way, are front loaders it saves you a lot of space. And I don't have a lot of space here. I don't have any space to waste. And if I had to climb behind, oh, the plague doctor is here. I get my iced coffee. I was getting a little scratchy throat from the pollen. Thank you, plague doctor. Much appreciated. I can violate, uh, you know, distancing with the plague doctor here. It pretty much allows me to go wherever I want. 
they used to wander around the streets in 15th century Florence and, you know, help people that had the plague. They, I got one of them. What a handy thing to have. I, I didn't know it would come in so handy, but definitely something you want to get for your house if you can. So it's a front loader. I don't have much space behind it. So I don't want to get behind this thing. That would be a real pain for me. So I put it in front. You put it on the tray. You get it in place. This is an Avery 3303, for example, brand new roll. I already downloaded it from the media locator just to save a little time. But it's right on here. You click it. You type Avery. You have a long, long list of them, and it automatically you know, plugs in. So then the next thing to do is to load it. Substrate load. I do a manual load because I think it works a little better and it's a little faster, but we do have an auto load feature. Lift the lever, take the vinyl. Hopefully it won't give me any grief trying to get stuck in there, but it should be okay. There we go. Push it forward. Let it kind of go. I'm going to line it right up on these little blue lines, which works perfectly. Uh, we do have edge guards. You can use them if you like. I don't see a big need to use them on, uh, on adhesive vinyl, and I rarely do, but I'll put them on there anyway. And then I drop the lever. And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to throw up a screen and say, what are you? Are you banner? Are you paper? Are you film, textile? And it is adhesive vinyl. And I choose Avery, and I choose Select. And now... It's going to go to continue, and I'm going to load it in. The printer is automatically going to figure out inside or outside wind. It's then going to figure out how wide it is, and then it's going to figure out where the edge is, and then it's going to figure out the ideal step alignment, the OMAS. It's going to step alignment, and then it's going to figure out is the skew that you have in there right for the tolerance that I set. And there's a default tolerance, but you can adjust it to have more or less tolerance on the SKU. And then once all that is done, I'm good to go. But because I downloaded a new media, I recommend doing a color calibration, which I'm going to do, and I'll show you how that works. Once the color calibration is done, I can print, I can create more print mode. So what's in there is 12 past 100% density. If I want to do 8 pass, 80% density, I can go make one. The color calibration is good for all print modes. You only have to do it once, and you only do it on occasion. And then you can build new ICCs and build as many modes fast or slow as you want. They're all custom made. We have them certified by a third party that we send the media to. They do all the evaluations. It's a very elaborate 16-point look. If everything is good, they say stamped, that is at a certified HP media, and then you can download them at your leisure. If you stick to certified medias, your chances of being successful are really high, and there's like thousands of them. You can use generics if you want. I don't. I either use a certified media, I use a media that's very similar to the one that I'm going to run, or I'm going to build my own, because building your own is super, super easy. So that's loaded in. It's ready to go. I'm going to roll it back a little bit and save myself a little waste. That's a little much. And then I'll hit color calibrate. Come on. Stop thinking. We do have solid state hard drives. All of the hard drives that we have on here are solid state. So generally they don't crash. They don't have problems. We also have an online um, cloud-based application system called Print OS. And Print OS allows you, for example, to back up your whole hard drive onto the cloud anyway. So in this first thing right there, it says, is this calibrated? And it says color calibration is obsolete or recommended. So I need to do a color calibration. Also, just so you know, I have all my inks in here. <laughs> They're actually all expired. Uh, HP, uh, HP San Diego ink team would be appalled. So just to give you an idea, I have new inks, but I'm kind of testing to see how long they'll last. I mean, I have an idea what happens when your inks get too old. You either lose color intensity because, you know, you're not getting the 100% magenta you're supposed to. It's more like 90% of it, and the color starts to dim. Or you could potentially damage the print heads, but I have a bunch of extra print heads. So just to give you an idea, my light magenta... 
expiration date, 9-11-2017. Still working. A lot of them are 17, 2018. Um, We're not going to tell you you can't use expired inks. We will tell you when they're expired. We'll tell you that you should probably take them out. We'll tell you that if your printhead is damaged by running a bunch of expired ink, it's on you, but we won't tell you you can't do it. So if they run over a little bit, it's not the end of the world. These have been in. Uh, I'm going to drain them to the bottom. I always drain everything. I'm going to see how long they're going to last. And, um, you know, what the heck? It, it, it still seems to be printing great. And I, I haven't noticed any color problems associated with it, although they probably are a little off. So just so you know, I have a little ink issue. <laughs> I bring that up because... One, I know it's irritating when you're told, hey, these are like two weeks over and you won't let me use them. Okay, that's not us. We're not, we're not, we're not jerks about that. I mean, we'll tell you. We'll give you the like finger wagging, but we're not going to prevent you from doing it. So I'm going to go to settings here and I'm going to go to image quality maintenance and I'm going to do color calibration and then calibrate. So this media is going to get its birthday fingerprint for color. That's automatic. That's the first thing you want to do when you download. And after that, I am good to run. So then I'm going to start sending jobs over to it. All of our stuff has take-up reels. I use them. Uh, they're very handy. The 500 series even has a spindleless take-up wheel. These are using spindles. Also, another feature on this printer, I'll show you these. The 300 and 365 and the 500 have these on them, and there's two of them. They're called ink collectors. The ink collector is designed so that if I'm running fabric that's porous or if I'm running linerless mesh or I'm running a flag banner, these are foam inserts that go right into the platen. The foam can all be replaced, and that's what all of this is, is, is extra ink. So as you run it, over time, you're going to replace the foam inserts, but it allows you to print through material and not get it all over the platen. It's a handy thing. It comes on the 365 and the 500. The other 315 and 335 are flat platen printers. You can print fabrics and stuff. You can print mesh, but you have to have a liner for the mesh or the fabrics have to be what we call coated or airtight so that the ink does not pass through it. The fabric that I'm running on the bottom there, it is a EnduraFab Front Lit Premier. That EnduraFab is durable, so that it meets a certain scratch and scuff resistance for HP fabrics. In addition, it's airtight. That is, when I hold it up to the light, I don't see any pinholes. So even though it's not coated, it's woven so tightly that no ink is going to get through, and I run it right on the flat platen. I don't have to put those in. So with this thing rolling merrily along, I'll give you a very brief explanation of the cutter. We have different options on how you want to pair things. So if you're interested in print and cut, we have a bundle that gives you the printer and the SUMA HP cutter, which has a full barcode system built in, along with the Flexi software that can run not only the two together, but also has a Flexi designer element. So you're getting a full print and cut package, because usually uh, most of my adhesive vinyl in one way or another is going to go to a cutter. And anything that's like a design or something, like I got Ganesh over here, everybody's favorite business-minded elephant with the snake belt. And I have this set up so that I can perf it and kiss it and then just have the whole thing come out and send these out. Um, I'd probably make the perf a little deeper so it would come out a little easier, but you get the idea. And then this is the barcode system that drives it all. And the barcode system identifies what job. It identifies what orientation. It'll even do it like on a roll. So I'll put this in the back, put the whole thing onto the core, bring the core over there, have like a ton of jobs, but have them broken up, you know, into different barcodes, send them as individual jobs, let it run on a take up onto the printer for a, an hour or so, and then move the whole thing to the cutter and just say, find the first barcode. And once it does, it just keeps finding the next barcode and finds the next barcode. And then I go to lunch. And then my PrintOS application on my phone, Android or Apple, monitors everything and tells me if everything's cool. Because 
We have software that keeps track of everything that you do. The goal of LaTeX really is to run unattended, including the cutter, including all the peripherals. So that is the basic operation here. It doesn't take too long for it to warm up. As you noticed, the ink is drying. Everything has to come through the front of this printer in order for it to be completely dry. If it doesn't go through that, it's not dry and it's not ready. However, when it does, everything that comes off the front of that printer dry is installable. Laminate it, do whatever you want to do with it. You're done. There's no wait time. There's no gas off time. There's none of that nonsense. You don't have to wait because it's tacky. Everything is completely dry, so I can always go to a take-up reel. It's print, take-up reel. It's not print, and I hope it doesn't stick to itself on a take-up reel. That doesn't go on with any of the latex. The settings are designed so that everything is evaporated. The latex encapsulates it. Our scratch resistance is without question the best in the business. I know this for a fact. Uh, what I have on the floor here, that mat, it's not a rug, it's actually a an ugly mat that I stuck IJ40 on it, mat IJ40, no lamination. Same with the one over here, same with this here. I generally do not laminate unless it's a vehicle wrap, long-term outdoor, like a, a decal on the side of a gas station thing, you know, where it's going to be in the sunshine for long periods of time, or some floor graphics and stuff I do because I want that um, strong anti-slip surface on it. The only other consideration for lamination to me is how am I going to take it off? So if it goes on a floor and that floor has a uh, no laminate, you have no laminate on it and you stick it down and then after a year you try to take it off and it comes in little tiny pieces, probably would have been a better, been a better idea to laminate it. Stuff I have on the walls over here, I don't laminate. I don't laminate bumper stickers. I just use a little thicker vinyl. I like the moderate tack so it doesn't stick so aggressively. And that way you can stick it on the car. I've got no issues. I, um, I have a lot of magnets that I print directly to. Magnum Magnetics, for example, makes an O2O, which is high intensity, so it functions just like a O3O. And I can run that through this printer. It's certified. I don't laminate. I stick it right on the car. Stuff looks fine. Now, in some cases, if you put it on a car and it's long term, it's getting a lot of abuse, you might be better off laminating for the cost of it. It's really your judgment call. But you don't have to laminate because our scratch and scuff is significantly better than any of the solvents. It's just what's your application? How long is it going to be there? And what are you trying to accomplish? And then what about removal? Vehicle wraps, for example, they all require a laminate to be part of the wrap system, and you wouldn't want to do it without it anyway because you'd never you'd, you'd kick yourself forever trying to take it off the car afterwards. So they really have to have a laminate. Printer is scanning the pattern, which is, I heard the spectrophotometer, the little lid, there's a lid on it, and it pulls the lid open. Now it's going to go through and read it. It's extremely easy to operate. It really is. I press a button. So I'll show you the cutter really quick since I'm here and the printer is doing its little thing. This is the chart, which that's what's at printing right now. I'm going to hit end. I'm going to lift this in. I'll bring Ganesh back here. It's got a nice straight line cut because it has a drag knife cutter on the printer. And that gives me a perfect point to line up from for any of my jobs. The cutters are well built, very reliable, extremely easy to use. They have a nice feature here that you don't have to, you can use a, a cut strip instead of changing positions on the blade. Cutter's going to go do its thing. It's going to figure out how wide is it. It's going to roll it forward, roll or a sheet. It's all pretty much automated. Once it's ready, I'm going to say find barcode. It's going to go find the barcode. And then I just ignore it because it's going to go uh, find the job, identify it, figure out what orientation it is, and cut everything automatically. The goal is that prints, that cuts. Laminator does laminator. Everyone has its own tool. We don't put everything together into one machine. Now, what I'm going to do here briefly is I'm going to switch to software because I want to show you how the software works 
most of my operations I do either with Onyx or with SAI Flexi. SAI Flexi comes with a lot of our machines depending on the configuration. And we have a print and cut bundle as well as the 315 and the 335. It comes with like a version of just the rip. Onyx is uh, what we run, at least for myself, I run with a lot of the 500 series. Um, both of them do a brilliant job. HP is handling a lot of the color. HP is handling a lot of the processing. Our onboard um, spectrophotometer in conjunction with our hard drive is doing much of the heavy lifting. So rips are really more about preference of how you want to lay things out. You can use Caldera, you can use Onyx, you can use Flexi. We don't really take a position other than we partner with Flexi for some of the print and cut stuff, especially because it makes things very easy for us. And Flexi runs on a PC. We're a PC-based company and all of that. Uh, let me get this thing going. Barcode. There's a little button, barcode. <laughs> set tool in front of barcode. I will set the tool in front of the barcode. I got too much waste there. And so it's going to go and find the barcode. And everything works as advertised. It'll always find it. Every once in a while, I have a glitchy network where it finds the number and it knows what it is, and then it just sits there. That does happen, but it's been good all day today. And the suspense is killing me. Unbelievable. Maybe I turn the computer on and off. I don't know. So that's calibrated, it's done. And yeah, it found the number, but now it doesn't know what to do with it. I'm gonna just turn it on and off again. Sometimes that clears its brain. I turn the software on and off quite a bit, and sometimes it may get delinked. So I'm gonna switch here to this computer and Zoom meeting, share screen, share. And here's my Flexi software. This is the RIT part. Uh, I upgraded it a little bit because the version you get with Print and Cut actually is, is upgradable. You own it. It's not light. It has full ICC profiling support built in. It also has full Pantone colors. I mean, you're getting a full-fledged version, plus you can expand it, plus you could bring in any other you know, cutters or whatever you want. It's Flexi's open architecture, plus you own it. It's not a rental. So I'm running down here, I got this 360, and there's my very many images. So there's Kinesh, I usually send him quite a bit of the time. So it sh Flexi should be able to find that it has, I have switched to Avery. So I am, there's my Avery 303. It's automatically gonna go and load that in. I'm going to make sure it's linked to the proper profile. So I'm not using a 3M profile. I switch to the Avery. It's throwing me a warning message saying you've got an incompatibility there. I'll fix that. Now it's gone away. Which cutter are you going to send this to? I'm going to send it to the 54. And then this is where you do all your layouts. So whatever you want to do. I usually put an inch between them if I'm doing a, a perf cut and a kiss cut. The little um, cutter here indicates that, in fact, yes, I do have a kiss cut and a perf cut set up. I built this for a 3M no lamb. So what I should probably do is when I load this in is adjust my cutting depth and create a new template for Avery 3303 no lamination because every material is a different thickness and every material has a slightly different liner. So I'm just going to send this and I'll deal with that a little later. And away it goes. This is the designer part, which is the full flexi designer, which comes with a print and cut. And I just think it's a nice piece of software. You can use it just as a cutter. So you just go up here and hit plot. So using cut vinyl, usually what I'm doing most of the time is I'm putting contour cuts around things. So my last step after I get my file ready, which is usually done in Photoshop, is I take the image, bitmap, make transparent, 
click on that. Gives me my dancing ants. There they are. I hit OK. And once I do, it's ready to put my contour cut. I have it done in red. It's on the outside a little bit. Usually I do them in lime green and then I do gray from my perf cut. So now I have a contour cut. You can bring it in or out. It's really that easy. Hit OK. And then if you want to put a perf cut, usually what I do is just, there, there's my perf cut. And then make that. Perf cut contour. There, I'm done. And I save it. Now I have a kiss cut and a perf cut. It's super fast. It's easy. It's all integrated. I can save it here or I can actually do a print and cut right out of here if you want to. Excuse me, rip and print. So it just depends what you want to accomplish. Some other very key features in the software. Number one, we've got a great YouTube system. There I am. And the way this works is you go to YouTube HP support. And then once you're at HP support, you got a million videos. You don't want a million videos. How to replace the control panel on a laser jet. You want to type in latex. And then once you're at latex, you tell it what you want or just latex. So if you're in latex, there's a ton of videos on what to do. They're all in there on everything, hundreds of them. There's like really fat me, look at that, big as a house. 335 pounds, huh? And I live to tell the tale. I figured if I wore a jacket, like nobody would notice. <laughs> so you go through here and we have a ton of information on, on latex, everything you want to know. So if you want to do latex, fabric, It'll tell the whole story of our fabric, coated and uncoated, different types, durable latex, all that stuff. And uh, that's our HP support for YouTube. Um, obviously, there's a ton of information also with, uh, there's also a ton of information which is provided with um, Flexi and Onyx and all of those guys all have their own YouTube channels and they have a ton of information on them. They're very, very good. This is called the Media Locator, and it's connected to a larger thing called the Print OS. Go away. Print OS is all free. You get it with a latex printer. So when you sign up, we give you all this software. It has an application center, which I'll get to last because it's like ridiculously cool. Hang on a second. I'm going to do one thing here. Oh, good. Temperature is fine on that. Okay, perfect. It made some adjustments for me. Configuration center. I'll go through these kind of one by one. This is actually the demo center in the experience center in Alpharetta, Georgia, down the road from me. And this is our entire print OS operation. If it stops spinning. Oh, please. Not now. We'll have to come back to you. Here's PrintBeat, which is part of it, same idea. All of our printers, it controls all of them, every job that's ever been run through them, everything, everything there. So I know everything that's going on on the printers, which right now is much of nothing. But all the other printers are operating. So this is the entire Demo Center Latex line of printers, all available. Then we also have the uh, Service center, so our service team is structured now so that we can um, type in latex. And then we have 11 devices. So right now on the latex 1500, I have an open case. And this is what's going on. What we're trying to create here with the whole print OS, it's like Google Apps or um, 365. What we're trying to create here is something that you log in, you have one login point, 
We have your information. You don't have to keep filling out forms. You can track everything that's going on from one location. So if you have a problem with the printer, you introduce a new case. There's two open cases on our 3600, and they're all listed here. And if I needed to, I create a new case. And you can track everything from here. I'm busy. I don't have time to be calling people on the phone and tracing them down. And is this guy here? And where are you with this? And what's going on? I want to go on here just like Amazon, click on it, re reach out to them. Here's three or four ways to do it. They know who I am. They have my information. And then they get back to me. And then I can track it and be on top of everything. So I can just check in on this throughout the day. Super cool, right? We have a knowledge center. This is where all of our information is put, including our blogs and all the other stuff. So you can log on this anytime you want to. Very helpful. Configuration Center is really about color. Now this is the demo printers in the demo center, but I know what's loaded on them, and I know that this needs a color calibration. This needs a print head alignment. This is these are packages like I would send to another person in my team and I can share with them and then firmware updates. So it is maintaining print head alignment which is influencing your color calibration and your packages. I could control multiple locations around the country all from one site and then make sure everything is as far as color all lined up properly and is all using the latest firmware with a current print head alignment and a current color calibration all based on a package that I would deploy from here and share it with all of my team and they can download it right into their printers and that's effectively what that does media locator been around forever this is what we use to get your media it's the same that's on the printer panel is what's on here you click on there, click filter, you type printer models, I have a latex 365, and then say manufacture if I wanted to do say 3M, or let's change that, let's go durable textiles. Application, subtype, type, durable textile. These are all of the textiles that have been certified as a four or better on a dry crock test, and this is where you get them. We have three pages of them, all certified. You can download them from here and then use the embedded web server here to send things back and forth if you so choose. Or you can just go download them into the printer, which is probably easier. But if I sent you one or you sent one to your buddy or anything else, you can import and export everything from here. This is what's on my printer right now. So this Avery, if I made some adjustments or whatever I did to it and I wanted to send it to somebody else, it's in there. Not in alphabetical order, by the way. That would make it too easy. But it is in there, right there. Now while we're here, this is the way you contact the printer previously. It's still available. We still use it. It's still great. That's all going to change and this is all going to become print B. We've moved to the cloud. The cloud can run tablets and phones and it's secure and it's all, this is what we're building on now. The old version, which is still fully functional, is what we used to have, which is really based on the IP address of the printer and then you put this information in. Probably the coolest thing that's on here is the accounting. This is invaluable. So what you do is you put in cost assignment. So I do 775 milliliter and I do $165. Now the ink is not $165. I am doing ink plus the expected life of the print head plus the cleaning cartridge, all consumables. We have already established that at eight pass 100% density, it's 21 cents a square foot, all consumable. But what you really want to know is, if I ran an IJ40, and there's my pricing, and I put this formula in, which is very fair, because it is a true all-consumable, when I scroll down here, this Ganesh here, see I don't have the, me the media put in, but some of the other ones here I ran it on IJ40 do, and it knows that the substrate was $3.30, and the ink used was $1.15. And it tells me exactly, not estimates, these are not estimates, this is exactly how much ink travels to the printhead. This is what it costs to run Ganesh. And you can export this to Excel and look at it in a proper bean counter software. 
this is a cool program. This gives, there's no, I like, what I do is I use an estimator and then I verify my estimator and my actual print are lined up. And now I know my estimator is spot on or it needs some adjustments. This is a very good way to get all of your cost information and know exactly what you're printing. I also use it as a production manager and I'd go, okay, what's this canceled by user stuff? Did we get that out the door or is that all waste? Because I got a bunch of waste here. Unless somebody says, you know, I just stopped the job or why are you stopping jobs? I want to see done, 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 money, check, check, money. Not, is it in the trash can somewhere and you're hiding it from me? <laughs> so this is a very handy program for all of that. And this is how I communicate to the printer. Also service, support. Oh, one other support thing, kind of cool. If you go service support, printer information, it's going to contact the printer. That's what it's doing right now. And it wants to know everything about this printer. And you can dig into this thing like super deep. So if you want usage information about the printer, it's going to go find out everything you want to know, every job that's ever been run, every error message. It will help our uh, service team if you provide this information. It's all voluntary. But we can look at it and see if there's ongoing error messages that you should know about. This here, when it's going to take a second to pull the data. Once I do, though, you see this one right there? See what that is? That is the print head nozzles out. So it says slot one, there's your optimizer. We have one nozzle out. Now keep in mind how many nozzles we have. So these are really print heads are in perfect health. There's no problems with them. But it checks all of the slots constantly and says, are you missing a nozzle? Are you missing a nozzle? Now some of these may get reclaimed. But if I have an issue, I can easily drill down and figure out what's going on. Because I know what's going on in every last detail on everything on the printer all the time. We're very meticulous about collecting information and sharing that with you. The last thing, I'll get through this, <laughs> I promise, is the application center. And the application center is a new tool that we've developed that I think has tremendous advantages. And what it's offering here is uh, a complete online sign building suite that your customers can take advantage of and you control the jobs and you control the content and then they can send you finished work. So in order for my sales team to get me to print anything for them, I want them to use the application center. I don't, it, it takes, it's a lot of data that it's loading in. Sometimes it takes a little bit to load up. The application center, we've also introduced a ton of new, um, come on, you're almost there. There you go. Face masks. So here's how it would work. You would set your customer up. You know, I have some customers set in here already. They're basically our ne'er-do-well sales team that won't use it. But so, so Ace Freely is John Stevens, okay? So Ace Freely can log on here as a company, and then he, Ace Freely, John says, Tim, my, uh, we want to get COVID masks for my whole family, or whatever it, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, we want to have posters. So if you want to do posters, you go to posters. And then depending on the content you have there, they can put their own content up if they want. What they do is there's your poster, they pick the size, and then all this stuff is on here already. Like it's all built in, tons of it. And then you can add your own or whatever else you want to do. So if you want to say, you know, here's your coronavirus or we're open or social distancing or whatever your information is, there you go. And here's what's cool, it's all editable. All right, so they can make their own changes if they want. They can make it whatever color they want. And then once it's done, say, okay, that's what we want. We want like 20 of those. Okay, that's cool. Final check. Hit next. Depending on what you told it for pricing and how many, I want three of them, it's $80. And then once it's add to order, oh, which one did then it's going to go right back to here, and it's going to be in my order. Go back up there. There's my order bin, and it sends me an order. 
That's it. And you can get checks and all sorts of, I mean, it does magnets, it does t-shirts, it does vehicles, everything. It's all built in. It's all custom. You can make whatever you want. You can put your sizes in. And if you spent, I think, a week investing in getting this all in and having it linked, it links right into your website. And you can put your own logos in there. Like I've got my, my silly uh, latex czar logo that kind of set up with this. You can make it look exactly like your product, and you can just have your customers build whatever they want, and you don't have to do it. I think that's our core parts of our software as far as – now I'm going to turn the camera back on. Hang on just a second here. I'm trying to turn it off when I'm making the other computer, so we should be back. And that's really the core messaging of the software linked in with the printer. And the result is, which we do in another, another little video, is all the applications. So all t-shirts and heat transfer, wall coverings, canvas, highway signage, including uh, reflective and high intensity prismatic, which also carries with it between a 10 and 13 year warranty, depending what you're trying to accomplish. All your window films, your static clings, window, uh, clear focus, window perf, um, cast vinyl and our seven year warranty with 3M. Um, we're the only company that gets cert uh, meets type two requirements for wall covering with no lamination needed. This is a PVC free suede and smooth wall covering HP that is durable, does not need lamination. It breathes. It has all of these requirements for cleaning and everything. So anybody looking to put wall covering in a hospital or whatnot, you can use massive cleaners with this because type two is designed so that you clean it all the time. We even tested it with a hundred percent cleaner. So it's not diluted and it still did extremely well. So this is the kind of wall covering you want to use in sensitive environments, like say a hospital where they also want to be able to clean all the walls perfect product for that. And then all the other traditional wall coverings, PVC, PVC free, peel and stick, photo text, uh, Aurora, banners of all kind, double sided banners, single sided banners, roll up banners, whatever kind of banner you might possibly want. Uh, Tyvek, photo paper, poster paper, I've run cardstock, every form of canvas, we dominate the canvas market paper-based wall coverings, self-adhesive wallpaper, peel-and-stick wallpaper, simple potato paste wallpaper, films, roll-up films. We do a lot with awnings. We are uh, about ready to have a five-year certification with Sumbrella for outdoor digitally printed awning. We do a lot with window drop-down shades. Because our uh, color fastness is so good, people use them, no lamination. You just print them onto, say, for Seadig or Junker and Mueller sunshade, sunblock shades. And then those are all automated, so you press a button and it's really cool. They all drop down, but you have now a custom digitally printed logo on a window shade, a window blockout. I do all kinds of window graphics. There's a new product called Squid. It's almost like a Belgian linen. I have it up in my windows in the front room. It's absolutely gorgeous. Very, very good, durable outside. Um, backlit fabrics, all kinds of different types of fabrics. Um, outdoor durable, come on, let go. Outdoor durable banners. So sign face banners, view light, panographics, that kind of stuff. Excellent. If you want to put a liquid laminate on something like this on the floor, that's fine. You know, it's textured, so you can't put a film laminate, but if you wanted to roll on, say, a nice liquid-based laminate to give it a little more durability, cool. It'll get a little more durability for cleaning and, and uh, against skateboarders and whatnot, and it will give it a little more sun durability. So there's no problem with doing that. I just don't think it's necessary for a lot of applications. It, just, it depends what your installation is, where, and what your customer's expectations are. But you can print on all of it. And being with a built-in color calibration and the built-in spectro, I run a ton of media that is not on the media locator. 
Um, I just make it from scratch all the time. That's what most of those roles over there is people are giving them to me and said, hey, does this work on latex? I would say there's a 95% chance that, yeah, it works fine on latex. Uh, we print direct to magnetic. I do magnum magnetics, O2O, print directly to it. It's certified, works great. The O2O is the same thick. It's Normally you have to use O3O for a vehicle. O2O will give that to you if it's a high intensity. So it's the same magnet intensity, but in a thinner magnet. The printer supports 0.5 millimeter clearance. The, the head height is not adjustable. So it'll print effectively, think of it up to O2O. That's your limit. That's 0.5 millimeters. The magnet magnetics is just a hair under O2O, which gets it under our tolerance. You can run O3O. It will fit in there, but you do not have any room for error, okay? You're right up against it. So if you make a mistake, you could take out a printhead. The bad news is you took out a printhead. The good news is you can replace it with another printhead for about $125, and you can be up and running again. I just made a truly boneheaded mistake on this printer and took out two printheads yesterday. Just dumb. My fault, not paying attention. I had an edge guard that had kind of gotten popped up, and rather than take it out and push it down, it got caught on some piece of fabric, and then boom. And the printer said, okay, you got to replace the print head. And then it said, actually, you got to go replace this one too. I pulled them out, put two in, printer did everything. I'm up and running in less than a half an hour. Okay, if I had piezo print heads, I'd be on the phone. Where's the print head? Who can come out? Who's going to install it? It would be big dollars, and I would have a wait time. I wouldn't be running it today. So because I have user replaceable print heads and they're cheap, yeah, I don't want to drop two, you know, 250 bucks either, but I got, I'm out 200, I'm not on anything, I get free print heads, but you'd be out $250 and it'd be, you know, lesson learned, dumb, pay more attention, but you're up and running today and you're getting jobs out the door to make money to pay back the print heads that you just took out. Um, the print heads, the expected life on a print head is four liters. I, I totally mean this. You can do quite a bit better if you take care of it. And I'm very disappointed. This is the first time I've ever taken two print, out, print heads out together. And this is the first time in a long time I've taken print heads out. It does happen. You make mistakes. But it's been years since I took out a print head. But it's just not that big a deal if you do because you take them out, you see the torn, you know, film on it. You know it's damaged. And then you just put another one in and the printer handles everything. So we've covered the printer, all the little toys that operate and run the printer. I covered the cutter to some degree, some of the stuff floating around the floor, at least a general overview of the applications. That in and of itself is a whole deep dive. And the software. The software does run everything. And you can use Onyx, Caldera, Flexi. It's really your choice. We don't, we, we're not, uh, we're very, uh, uh, non-partial there. They, they're all certified RIPs. They've all been tested to work properly with our latex technology. Uh, I use them all interchangeably. Since I'm on a PC platform, I tend to use Flexi and Onyx a little more. Oh, and you got to meet the plague doctor. Well, you didn't really meet the plague doctor, but you saw the plague doctor. Okay, I guess at this point, I have reached the end of the road, Good probably the end of your patience. Joe. Hi, Joe. Uh, we have some questions. And as a reminder to anybody who still wants to ask a question, there is a chat box at the bottom of your screen. Okay. But Tim, Timothy, if we can go through a couple questions, please. Question number one is, sure. is fade resistance based on the new latex inks or does it include older latex inks as well? The fade resistance I'm quoting is based on the Gen 3 current latex inks. However, I don't think that there was a very big difference in color fastness in Gen 2 and Gen 3 in terms of color fastness, because that's mostly pigment dependent. But the Gen 3 did prove to, and this I'm doing this by memory, I can't remember Gen 1, it's too far back. My recollection is that a 260 got a five or six year warranty with 3M, and Gen 3 is getting, initially got a six year and now got a seven year warranty with 3M. Very That's good. my recollection. Okay. Question number two. Now, if you're not putting a laminate on, 
just so you know, that's done objectively by 3M. Avery does the same and everyone else. If you're not putting a laminate on, you're just hanging up a banner, it really depends on a lot of factors, what state, how much sun, a lot of other things. But when you do uniform testing like that, and we get that much better than everyone else, I think it's fair to also assume we would also do better in just a banner with no lamination hanging on it. Okay. Um, question number two, how many extra nozzles are there on a printhead? Oh, that's actually a really good question. In other words, how many do you use and how many you need? I, I think my recollection is we use about 30% that are on the head and then the other are available if we have to replace nozzles. Okay, um, here's but a that's question. That's actually a really good question. Okay, um, here's a question. I'm not sure we can give a simple answer here. You'll, you'll be the judge of that. We may need to follow up on this, but the question is how do you program cuts in the cutter? Oh, well, you have two kinds of cuts. You have a kiss cut and if you're using it, a perf cut. So in the software, now you can do it one of two places. You can do it on the cutter and then tell the software, you stay out of it, I'm doing this on the cutter. In which case you would set it for default and then it will defer to the cutter. If you choose a preset, which is what I do, means I'm running it from the software. In the software, I go in there and tell it exactly what I want for my kiss cut, what speed, everything. And then same with the perf cut. And there's a series of settings and they're effectively the same settings that you have in the control panel of the cutter. I do them in the software because I like a graphical interface. And also I've already chosen the cutter is where I'm going to, or the, the software is where I'm going to direct traffic. So some people do it the other way. Don't mix them. That'll make it very confusing. Now, in order to test where my blade is and everything, then what I do is I go over to it. I'm going to roll this back a little bit. I hit settings. And then I'm going to do knife pressure. That's the first one. And that's going to determine there's a little test there. So 75 grams, there's a little square. I do it, I pull the square off and right now 75 grams is perfect. So then I remember that and hit apply in there. And then the second one you do is scroll down and do flex cut and open it and hit test. It's going to do a perfect little rectangle and you punch it and see if you like the punch. You can control the tabs. You can control line space. There's a lot you can control in the shape of your perf, but usually I leave that at default because I haven't had any issues at all. And then I just tell it, you know, how deep do you want to go? And it depends on the media, if you have laminate and the liner, and that's going to determine your ideal perf cut. So this is set for about 200. So 75 and 200 with this blade in its condition. Now, if it's a new blade, obviously everything gets reset and I, I could probably do it at 65 and 180. Just depends on the sharpness of your blade. And then I would go into the software into Flexi and I go into that tab for 3M IJ140, that's what that is, and say, we want to be 75 and 200 for now. And then as the blade gets older, I might loosen that up a little bit by occasionally doing a test over there and making sure everything is cool. So I control from the software and the software has all the settings that I need to um, uh, adjust my kiss cut and my flex and my perf cut. Good, thank you. Next question. You're welcome. Does the 365 communicate with Onyx version 12 for creating ICC profiles? 365 Onyx 12. Um, you have two ways to create ICC profiles. Well, three. First, use the printer. You do it right on the printer. Once you finish the ICC, okay, it'll come up on there. First, you do a close loop color calibration, and then you say create ICC. It'll print the chart, finish it, and then it will say custom. You hit then say finish. Onyx is automatically going to go over to it, grab the ICC profile you just made, put it into the um, media, you know, the media control software, the, the module, and it's going to place that ICC 
into that folder and replace the default ICC that comes in when you use a generic. And then that's going to be a custom ICC that Onyx uses when it processes the file. Your second option is to say, I don't want to use the onboard on HP. I want to do a more custom one. Fine. Do the closed loop calibration and hit finish. Then you go into Onyx. I fire up my I1. I print, a, let's say I want to do a chart of 2,000 swatches, much bigger, bigger ice, a bigger profile to have more accuracy. Then I'm going to print those, read it, and then I'm going to use Onyx to create the ICC profile, and then that will be associated with that um, media anytime you print it. Keep in mind, if you do it all on the HP, it's universal to any RIP. Anything, it'll, I would send it to you as an OMS file, and the OMS file will get loaded in through the embedded web server. And then once it's into the printer, any RIP, Caldera, Onyx, whatever, will go and get that ICC. If you custom make your ICC in Onyx, it remains, the ICC part remains proprietary to Onyx. And so really, I would export that as an OML file, which is Onyx file, and then only use it with people using Onyx with the HP printer. You can do it either way, or you can use a third-party ICC creator like XWrite and then import it into Onyx, and that works also. Those are your three options. Mostly I use HP. If I'm going to do something that needs to be super accurate and I need to have a very clear understanding of my ICC gamut and I need to know how close I am to certain colors through Delta E, then I'll make a bigger one and use Onyx's ICC creation software or Flexi's or Caldera's, and then, but then it's unique to that RIP now because you built the ICC in that RIP. That same participant asked um, a follow-up question, and the follow-up question is, will you ever have a white ink option? Well, uh, here's where we are. We have... Um, we have white ink on our flatbeds, so we do have a white ink option. So there is a latex printer that prints white ink. Um, I am not in any kind of loop on new products. All of the new products are uh, developed out of Corvallis, San Diego, where our print head and ink teams are, and then Barcelona, Spain, where our engineering team is. So the team in Barcelona handles all of the testing and execution, they don't really communicate outside of Barcelona. And then when things are ready, then they announce that they're ready. But they do all the elaborate testing in ahead of time. I have no idea what they're working on. They haven't told me anything. And obviously, this whole shutdown, it's got HP Global shut down in a lot of places. So if there is stuff, now I'm delayed. We have a white ink on a flatbed. It's, let's just call it Gen 4 latex. It exists. It runs at a lower temperature. It has a little more saturation. Um, there's a lot of advantages. It's really cool. But it, it's only on the flatbed right now. I'm just saying, like, and I don't know anything special. <laughs> we're always inventing new print heads. We're always inventing new ink. And we're always looking to keep upping our game. You know, we're not one of these companies that's going to come out with a new printer every two years and all we did was change the color or some silly feature. Like we make fundamental strides in innovation. We're an innovation company. We're going to put people out of business because we basically keep making better and better and better ink and better and better print heads. And we leave people in the dust if you don't make ink and print heads. So in my opinion, it's got to come. They're just looking at, you know, probably a lot of logistical factors, what type of printers, what, you know, what size, do we put them on the big ones or the little ones? But I'm just theoretically looking at the fact that we always innovate. I just don't know when. I don't know what the timetable, and I don't know. Maybe they would start at the industrial latex, which is our 10-footers, and they wouldn't get to the smaller ones till later, or maybe they don't see a value in the smaller ones. That's all research that's beyond my pay grade. Thank you. Thank you for the honest and insightful answer. Officially, I have not committed to any white ink printer, but, I mean, come on. We already invented it on a flatbed, so... You know, very good. None of us here on the call, I assume, are are dumb. <laughs> right. By the way, is this? Hold on. Did did he leave? Where'd he go? Was this one of our attendees? Did he, was that him? I didn't mean to offend him. You know, I love hipsters as much as the next guy. 
<laughs> Where'd he go? I saw him up here. He had this really funny, uh, funny uh, logo. I've got uh, just one more question in the queue. If anybody still wants to ask something, please submit it now. But the final question is, does HP have a video on replacing the carriage belt? Mm. Let, let me help you there. I just, this is, I guess, I this guess is I'm, weird. This is weird because I just got this question from a customer who came into my email and I know that we eventually found something that goes over it. It would come from service. So service probably does. I know that they have a white paper that walks you through it and service probably has one that, yeah, but that's a service related video. We wouldn't put it out on YouTube. Right. So to add to that, what I would say if somebody needs help replacing a carriage belt, they can call us and ask for technical support. You can do that by calling 262-703-9000. And for anybody else that is on the webinar, if you would like uh, some follow-up on product information or pricing or current promotion details, again, if you do not have the direct number for any of our sales representatives, you can call 262-703-9000. One more time, 262-703-9000. Timothy, that was a great presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, we wish you the best and we hope that you are back in your demonstration center very quickly. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, I wanna say one last thing really quick. I believe our service is outstanding. So, you know, I have a Ford 150 truck and my service center is just down the road here because they have every part and there's a billion parts for F-150s and I can get everything I need right away and it's no problem. And I know they've been there forever and Ford trucks ain't going anywhere. That's very true of HP. You don't really value, you don't see the value of our service until you deal with a lot of the alternative company service. We have global, national, large reach service of trained people that can come out. I've had them here in my garage and it just works just like you would get them. You know, you go on, you do a service call, they have an error code message, there's a part that needs to be placed, part gets FedExed, service guy lands here in time with it and it gets punched out and it's done. I'm very impressed with our service, especially when you compare it to what a lot of other places call service. We really do have, I think, people that step up and back up our stuff if something does go wrong. And these modular printers are crazy easy to fix. I mean, relatively speaking, we got this down to a science. So I did want to put in a plug for our service department, who I've always been very happy with. That's great. We do appreciate that. Thank you again, everybody. And if we can do anything to help you, please give us a call. Thank you, Timothy. All right. Get out in the sun, everyone. Go for a walk. Okay. Stop raining. Bye. Bye-bye.